Hi, hello, I am the Cyber Reef Guru. Thank you so much for watching. So for the regular viewers of this channel, you will recognize that I am not in one of my normal video filming locations. For the new viewers of the channel, first, welcome. Thank you for watching the video. So on this channel, we do a lot of content about making, and I have been focusing in on CNC most recently on the channel. But here in uh, 22, we are going to get back a little bit to the roots of the channel and branch out into some of the other topics that I've talked about in the past. And so this specific video is about laser cutters and laser engravers. Uh, so over the holidays, we were able to pick one up. We got it on a flash sale. So I'm going to talk a little bit about why we chose the particular unit that we did, the pros and cons of it, and then uh, some things that we're considering about doing in the future. All right, thank you so much for watching, and let's go ahead and get on with the video. So for a long time now, I have had this desire to get a laser cutter or a laser engraver. It really would have helped out a couple projects that I've worked on in the past and made things a lot easier. In fact, I almost invested in the Glowforge when it was in Kickstarter status, uh, but I had recently made an investment in another product that never came to market and I was still kind of reeling from the fact that I spent this money and I didn't really get anything from it. So I chose to wait on the Glowforge. Well, it did take almost three years for the Glowforge to come to market. It did ultimately come to market, and the models are very great. Now, I will tell you, I had the opportunity to make that initial investment uh, in the Glowforge for around $2,000 or $2,500, and they're currently selling for closer to five or six, depending on the model you get. So I might have lost a little money in that regard, but I think uh, you know ultimately the product that is out in the market today is, is better than the product that was initially released under that Kickstarter model. Nevertheless, recently my significant other came to me and expressed a desire that she had a couple projects that needed a laser engraver to pull off. And so that set me on the path of researching all the different options we had at our disposal today, including things like the Glowforge. Ultimately, the goal is to use this laser engraver and cutter in our Etsy store. So if you didn't know, we do have an Etsy store, so I will link to it below if you're interested in some of the products we might sell out there, or if you're interested in some custom work that we can do with this laser engraver we're happy to accommodate you so through the researching process I was leaning towards kind of going all in with the laser cutter slash engraver getting one of the upper end units that can do both cutting and engraving while the significant other was sort of leaning towards easing our way into the laser market and buying something that was relatively inexpensive that does just engraving now ultimately we did end up getting this OTOR laser master pro s2 we ended up getting it on a flash sale. We were out at lunch one day and I uh, got the notification of the sale. So we did end up saving $100 from the normal price, which is pretty awesome. And that really was the kind of final thing that led us to purchase this specific unit. But uh, let me go ahead and run through the different uh, capabilities and features of this unit. And then I'll get into the criteria that I use uh, to whittle the, the choices down a little bit. And then we'll jump into the kind of some of the compromises that I had to make to use this specific model over some of the other options that we are looking at. The OTOR Laser Master 2 Pro S is a 400 by 400 millimeter unit that has a 5 watt optical output. It does take 20 watts input. It is capable of 10,000 millimeters per minute in, in its maximum speed. Now we chose the short focus version of the laser. It comes in two forms, short focus and long focus. The short focus version of the laser has a beam dot size of 0.12 millimeters by 0.15 millimeters, which is almost completely square or round, depending on your perspective, versus the long focus version of the laser it does have a dot size of 0.17 by 0.25. 25 millimeters, which makes it a little bit more of a rectangle. So if you're looking for something that is producing more of a square beam, then the short focus version might be the one you want to choose. The unit does come mostly put together. The X gantry here comes completely assembled. And then all you have to do is assemble these rails here, install the control box and attach the drag chain. So it's pretty easy to put together. I will say the instructions that were provided were not terribly awesome 
system, but in combination of the detailed manual that you can download from the website, the video that they have on the website, as well as the quick start guide, the three of them together provide a uh, fairly good information that you can piece together and get the unit up and running fairly quickly. Overall, I would say it took me about an hour to uh, put the machine together after having uh, assembled and disassembled the rails probably about three or four different times. As I just mentioned, the unit does have a drag chain, so that's pretty convenient. It has an e-stop here on front, as well as a flame detector, which is actually on the front here, but it has a light and a buzzer on the front, so if it does detect some sort of fire, it will shut the unit down. It also has a tilt sensor as well, so if the machine does get moved, or bumped uh, while it's cutting and it gets off axis then it'll kill the laser as well which is a nice safety feature. You can get an optional air assist as well as the rotary tool for this specific unit and all of the OTOR models as well. It's pretty consistent and standard in this class of machines to have those options. The controller itself is a 32-bit controller that uh, interprets basic G code. However, the unit does not come with any software for a design or for driving the unit itself. For that, you need something like Laser Gerbil if you are using Windows, or you can use something like Lightburn if you are on a Mac. Macintosh or on Windows as well. Lightburn does have a small fee associated with it. It is $60. Relatively speaking, not a lot of money given the investment you're making in the cutter anyway, uh, but just something to note that adds to the additional cost. Now, I don't plan to go into the super details of the machine. There are plenty of videos out there on the internet that just dig deeply into the machine, talk about all the features and the capabilities. Some of my favorites include Brandon at Make or Break Shop and Jim at the Edge of Tech. I like their videos a lot and I found them very informative. And those two YouTube channels are the ones that I actually used to narrow in on my choices for laser engravers. And there's a couple upgrade options for this specific unit that make it a little bit more unique than some of the other ones. Uh, but Nevertheless, I do recommend those two channels if you want to dive deep into the laser world. So why did we choose the Ortor laser over some of the other options? Well, it really comes down to three primary decision points or considerations that I was looking at all of these lasers from. And so that is cost, safety, and convenience. So let me break each one of those down relative to this specific unit. So the first decision point really comes down to cost, and that is what I use to make a lot of my buying decisions. So the Ortor laser here is a normal price of $479, making it one of the least expensive laser engravers on the market. We did happen to get it during that flash sale that I mentioned earlier, so we saved $100. We ended up paying $397.44 US delivered to our door. It arrived in five days, which is really surprising because it came from China just right after Christmas. So given all of the shipping delays over Christmas, I was actually very surprised that it came as quickly as it did. The second major decision point that I used for selecting this unit really comes down to the safety and some of the safety features that are available on this unit. As I mentioned earlier, it does have this flame sensor here on the front that detects if your materials caught fire and it'll shut off the laser. It also has the e-stop on the front, which not a lot of the budget entry level engravers have. The other thing that it has is a tilt sensor that senses if the unit is uh, bumped or moved or off axis while it is operating and it'll also kill the laser if that's the case. And so that will protect the laser beam from you know, being emitted and potentially harming someone's eyes or burning something that it shouldn't. Another consideration that I consider a safety feature is how to evacuate the fumes that are created from the cutting and the engraving operations. So now in my office, the window that I would use to extract the fumes to is very high on the wall. It is a very small window and it is very inconvenient to get to. So uh, using my CNC with an attached laser module would make that a relatively inconvenient operation because I would be less likely to actually properly do the fume extraction with that window given where it is. So that actually leads me to my next category of selection criteria, and that was the convenience factor of the machine. 
The third and final category that I grouped my decision criteria in is the practicality or the convenience of the using the machine. And so right off the bat, I mentioned that one of the safety features is properly venting. And so the one of the reasons that I chose a unit that was not attached to the CNC machine is so that I could establish proper venting of the fumes. And so we've moved the unit here upstairs into the office here, and uh, we can vent it to the window that is right here it is a very large window it's easy to access and so creating proper ventilation for the machine is very easy in this specific location there's also a side benefit of having a unit that can be relocated to an alternate location is we can put it anywhere we want at any time it does not have to be up here into the second office we could use it in the garage we could use it outside we could relocate it maybe to a project that is larger than the work surface uh, so that we can uh, just stick the unit directly on the project and so that's another convenience and or practicality option that you would have for something like this versus uh, one of the units you might want to attach to a CNC or a larger uh, freestanding desk based unit now the last area again is kind of unique to my personal situation is having this unit here in the office actually co-locates it with my significant other's primary crafting location. This is the room where she does a lot of her crafting and so as the second primary user of the laser it is a convenience factor to have it up here in a room that she has all of her stuff in and is organized for her needs. Now ultimately what we will do is we will take this laser and we will just uh, mount it on the wall from a uh, perspective of storing it and then it'll free up this desk space for other operations and then when it is it needs to be in use just grab it off the wall it is very light it's easy to pick up stick it down put it on the desk go about your business and you're good to go so it really makes it a lot more practical and a lot more convenient for the people that are using this laser having a unit that is separate that is not tied to the CNC something that you can move around and also something that you can easily vent from a safety perspective so what were some of the other options that I was looking at before we decided to get the Orator laser? Well, first and most obviously for anyone who has been on this channel for a while, I first started looking at the laser unit that you can attach to the Onefinity CNC machine. That seemed at the time to maybe ha be the most convenient and the easiest solution because the CNC machine was there, it was assembled, it was available for use. But ultimately I ended up ruling it out for the reasons that I just discussed in terms of venting and safety, but also because the laser engraver unit is about two times the cost of this Orator unit. And so it was actually one of the most expensive potential options uh, to use with uh, the CNC rather than getting a standalone option in terms of laser engraving. Now, if you want to branch out beyond laser engraving and start considering some laser cutters, which I did, I started looking at the K40 units, which are very inexpensive units that come from China. You can get them in lots of different locations. Uh, Amazon is one place you can get them. And they're very inexpensive. They're actually right around the cost of this unit. And typically they come with a 40 watt CO2 laser, which makes them more capable as a laser engraver and a laser cutter. However, they're not very feature rich. Generally, they are enclosed, which makes them a little bit more safer, but they have substandard control units. They don't have some of the protections that this unit has. So it would have required a little bit of an additional investment to bring those units up to the standard that I was looking for, for simplicity and ease of use. Uh, the other downside of some of these units too is they do take up a lot of space. Generally, like I said, they are not uh, something you can pick up and move around easily. They are on a stand. Uh, so uh, that cost and the inconvenience of having to upgrade them was one reason that I kind of pushed them off to the side. Maybe something I might dig into in the future, but for for right now, it was just something I didn't want to tackle. The next category of lasers that I really dug into heavily and I was really leaning towards is this prosumer sort of version of lasers that the Glowforge, uh, Beambox, and some others fall into. What these are are CO2 lasers that are very similar, if not nearly identical to the K40, but they're a lot more polished and they come with a lot more bells and whistles. And so generally they come with some sort of software that allows you to use them. In some cases it's proprietary, in some cases it's not. 
uh, they have a larger cutting area than something like this. And again, they do have these CO2 lasers, which are capable of cutting and engraving. Now, the downside is the major downside is that they are significantly more costly. They are in the five to six to seven thousand dollar range, depending on the unit that you get. And so that really ruled them out from an entry level perspective after having our discussions between me and my significant other. So ultimately, we decided to get something a little less expensive. The final major category that I investigated was the professional line of lasers. Now these have similar capabilities, specifications as that prosumer line, but they're a little bit more beefy and they uh, can maybe withstand the test of time a little bit more than some of the prosumer units. Even though they are more capable, maybe they can go faster and they have higher power, they are significantly more expensive, generally speaking, than some of the prosumer models. And so that really did push it out of the range of attainability for uh, just getting our feet wet with laser cutters and engravers. Now I do have to say that I do see a uh, prosumer or a professional model in our future if this thing really does take off and we start to use it a lot, especially on the Etsy store. I could see so many opportunities for using a laser cutter that has high capability and high speeds over just simply laser engraving, but we'll hold that for the future. So the last thing I would like to note about laser engravers in general, I did investigate a ton of lasers that are in the same category or class as the Ortor. There are a number of them out there. Generally speaking, they all have the same optical output power around five watts. You can get ones that go up to 15 watts, but you can also upgrade this to 15 watts if you choose to do so. Now, the Ortor comes in as the least expensive of all these lasers in the class. Uh, the, the prices range anywhere from that uh, $400 range up to the six and seven, $800 range, depending on which options you choose. Uh, some of them are a little bit more solid construction than the Ortor, and some of them are nearly identical just with a higher wattage laser. So you do have a couple options if you want to stick to this class of laser engravers. Uh, but again, we just chose this one simply because there is a flash cell. So I do have to say that marketing totally worked on us. So with all purchases, you have to make compromises based off your budget. And I certainly had to make a few compromises with this oratory unit here. And first and foremost, compromise really comes down to the mechanics of the machine itself. It is belt driven, not very dissimilar to some of the CNC's that are on the market. Uh, but what I have noticed is the homing sequence does not seem to be terribly precise or accurate or repeatable. Now what I mean by that is when it homes, it does home and it homes properly every single time, but the position that it gets out of the homing process does not seem to be very repeatable. It does not always home to exactly the same location. So if you are doing a number of engravings or cutting operations with the machine that requires multiple passes that you need to home in between, you might not get very reliable results because the machine might not return to the same location every single time. Now, if you don't home in between the operations, the machine does seem to have a fair amount of precision and accuracy uh, there is a little bit of backlash because of the belts. So I am considering doing some detailed analysis and detailed measurements of the machine in terms of its, of its repeatability and backlash and some other things. So if you're interested in that, please leave your comments down below so that I know that that would be something that folks might want to have a video about. Now, the other thing that I have noticed about this machine is the control board and the stepper motors. And so uh, when the machine is not in operation, this controller does not seem to lock the stepper motors. So if you do bump it, uh, the, the machine will likely move or the gantries will move and you will have to rehome it. And so it, again, if you are relying on that precise positioning and you end up having to rehome, you might have some issues there. Something that I also noticed during operation is the machine doesn't seem to have very good tension on the stepper motors itself. And so I have actually bumped the machine while it was in operation and it missed a lot of steps. It moved dramatically actually, which seems a little odd to me because I would expect as the uh, stepper motors are engaged that they would resist force from movement from the outside a significant more than they actually are. So that is something I'm gonna look into in the future and again, if folks are interested in maybe another video about that, uh, just leave your comments down below and we'll dig in on that. 
The third compromise I've actually alluded to already, and that is just the fact that this machine does not have an enclosure. Now, Ortor does offer an enclosure that you can purchase for this unit, is relatively inexpensive. It does keep it fully enclosed, it makes it easier to vent, and it does have a shield to protect uh, the user so that they are not exposed to any of that laser light. Nevertheless, out of the box, it does not have an enclosure and it is not terribly easy to vent. So that is a safety concern that I did have have to compromise on, which is something that one of those prosumer or even a K40 or the professional models would provide uh, that this unit does not. So it's just something to consider, keep in mind when you're making your selection. So the final compromise that I want to discuss is really specific to the Onefinity and the options you have there. So the Onefinity CNC machine is capable of moving 250 inches per minute without any sort of problem. It can actually go faster. Now that is about uh, three and a half times faster than this machine could move. Now obviously when you're doing engraving or cutting, or maybe not so obviously, I don't know, uh, you don't necessarily want to move that fast. But having the option to move quickly uh, when you're using the machine when it's not in operation or whenever it's not lasering uh, is something that would be nice to have. This machine is limited to 10,000 millimeters per minute, which is higher than some of the other machines on the market, but it's not nearly as fast as uh, the speeds that the Onefinity can move. Now, on that topic specifically, the Onefinity also has high repeatability, high accuracy, and high precision, especially during the homing. I've done tests on that before, so if you're interested in that, I'll leave a link above. But uh, so that that would eliminate one of the issues that I'm having in terms of backlash and the repeatability of the homing with this unit. Now, I don't think it's going to be a big deal for the typical use cases that we're going to use it for, uh, but if you were trying to batch things out and you had set up some jigs where you wanted uh, parts in very precise locations, then it might be an issue for something like this that would eliminate that from the Onefinity. And certainly, if your Onefinity is in a location that can be properly vented, easily controlled, that would make it a lot more useful and a lot more user-friendly than maybe what I I have in my situation. And the last thing on that Onefinity uh, laser unit provided by JTEC is it does have some additional safety features that this unit doesn't appear to have. I'm still investigating it, uh, but the remote interlocks and things like this that you can add so that if the enclosure lid is opened, it'll turn the laser off and that kind of stuff uh, is something that would be nice to add to this unit if there's a capability of doing that. But I do know that the Onefinity laser unit does have that option. It also has a key to enable it. So you can uh, disable it, take the key out, and maybe uh, you know, protect that key from uh, children or other people who maybe don't know how to use the laser. And it gives a little extra level of uh, uh, safety so that someone who's not familiar or doesn't know how to operate the laser doesn't inadvertently turn it on and, you know, maybe hurt themselves in some manner. So there's a couple other things that I think with the Onefinity that maybe might be useful, but for me, it just didn't work in terms of uh, some of the other considerations that I have, but for you, it might be different. So I do recommend you look into the Onefinity laser module. If that is something you're interested in. Well, that was a video. I hope you enjoyed it. It was a lot of fun to make, like many of my videos. So if you enjoyed this specific type of content and you're interested in more content about laser engravers and laser cutters, please leave your comments down below and be sure to address them. If you liked the video, please consider giving it a thumbs up. If you didn't like the video, well, I'd appreciate a thumbs up anyway. But leave your comments down below. Tell us why so we can make future videos better. If you're not already following me on Instagram, please consider doing so. That's where I post pictures of projects like this to become future videos. All right, thank you so much for watching the video. Thank you so much for getting this far. And don't forget to be inspired. The first decision point really comes down to cost, and that is really what drives a lot of my own personal decisions. So the Otor laser here, <clears throat> Otor, or tour. Yeah. <clears throat> so what were some of those other options that I look <sighs> Roxy. Okay, so what were Good, I swear she's doing it intentionally. <laughs> the canine doorbell is going off. That's really awesome. There she is. This is where she does a lot of her work in terms of crafting with the uh, career cut or kai cut or whatever the hell it's called. No, whatever. <laughs> oh, good girl. Good girl. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you so much. 
you know, I'm recording a video. You know how many videos that you've jumped in on and tried to... Just said, what are you doing? What are you doing? Huh? What do you smell? I, I don't have any snackies in my pocket. <laughs> Does it smell that way? Do they spill something on my pockets? Huh? I don't know. Okay, thank you so much. Can you go lay down, please? Good girl. Go lay down. Okay, good. Thank you. Okay. You know, out. Good girl. I'm going to shut the door now. You go lay down. Go take a nap. <laughs>